I like big bikes and I cannot lie. Now who would not want 150 plus horsepower, 100 foot-pounds of torque between their legs? Kawasaki's Concourse 14, the big heavyweight sport tour that everybody's been buying up since 2009, unchanged largely even to this day. Stay tuned to find out what I think of this motorcycle. It's definitely been an interesting experience and uh, why this has been such a great success for Kawasaki. Zdravo i dobrodošli, bom dia, benvindos, servus, willkommen, buenos dias, bienvenidos, greetings riders, and welcome to another motorcycle review, my very own 2009 first generation Kawasaki Concours 1400cc Monster. This is just an incredible motorcycle and top of the line in the Kawasaki lineup. They basically sell themselves. You go on the website, there's minimal information on this motorcycle. There's just a picture of a gentleman parking it in front of his ultra luxurious, very modern cement mansion. So the fact that this bike is still sold to this day, 2021 model, and largely unchanged looks wise uh, speaks volume. This is a 2009, this bike came out in 2008. Prior to that, Kawasaki had the Concourse 1000 since 1986, also largely unchanged until 2008 when this one was brought to the market. Uh, from the ZX1000 previously, now to the ZX1400 line, ultra powerful motorcycle in the Kawasaki line and I finally had a chance to get to know it. This is my own motorcycle. You know, on this channel, I review bikes that I own so that you can get those honest reviews. I like it, there's a lot to like, but there's also a lot that I did not find all that interesting. For one, well, let's just go through all the details of the motorcycle. I'll let you know what I did like about the bike and I'll also let you know where the bike could be improved and uh, who this bike is for if you're considering this motorcycle, which I assume you are you're being here, there's a lot that you can know and how to pick a better year because 2009 uh, leaves a lot of room for improvement, even though they pretty much look the same. All right, so let's go through every detail of this motorcycle. I'll let you know what I like about the bike and what I don't like. It's not a bike that I'm gonna be keeping. It's just, it doesn't fit my needs all that well, to be honest, and there's a lot of room for improvement for these first generation 1400 Concours. So let me tell you what all that is. It might not be a deal breaker for you if you're looking into this bike, which I assume that's why you're here. But uh, there's been a few very important model changes from, from 2008 to the present model, which you'll still see in showroom floors. Pretty amazing that, you know, close to 15 years have passed by without major updates to the body itself. So let's do all the little details. Let's start with the power plant. Power plant, 150, I believe six, horsepower, 100 foot-pounds of torque, directly inherited from the very iconic Kawasaki ZX1000 line previously, 1400 now. It's the same kind of grill design that you notice, usually Kawasaki green, super po powerful, meant to rival the Hayabusa and the other most powerful motorcycles on the market. So the power plant is just absolutely stunning. I mean, there's a few bikers out there that might not enjoy 150 plus horsepower between their legs, but this bike really delivers. And you also get the torque with that as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but for a sport touring motorcycle, if you're carrying a passenger and luggage in these massive 35 liter side cases, then you need a motorcycle that's powerful enough to push through the wind to, uh, power up the hill to go around the trucks and, and pass overtake vehicles and this bike will do that all day long in fact it loves to be at 90 miles an hour that's kind of where the sixth gear the overdrive likes to stay at and i find that a little bit problematic for me because i that's where i tend to ride and 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 it's the kind of trouble that you don't necessarily need so the bike really likes to go fast it's it's definitely for more advanced motorcyclists who prefer to have that all-time power but who know how to control it that's the key here this is not a motorcycle obviously for beginners also because it's exceptionally heavy it's pushing 700 pounds 
that's for in my book for a sport touring motorcycle that's exceptionally heavy i just kind of failed to realize why they could not have made this bike at least 50 60 pounds lighter i know a lot has to do with the shaft drive system the shaft drive is very complicated because the law of physics dictate that the shaft driven motorcycles the rear wheel likes to buck under this is called the shaft effect it raises the motorcycle because as force is applied to the shaft the rear wheel tends to kind of duck underneath the motorcycle and raises the bike a little bit and that's mitigated by a tetra lever design which is similar to paralever design in bmw for example uh, I spoke about that when I reviewed the K1200S, another sport touring motorcycle, much lighter than this bike. So I know all of that adds a lot of weight. You can see this massive exhaust is just a big bulky bike. And obviously for an engine that's 1400 cc's, then you, you need a massive motorcycle. The benefit, you cut through the wind, you never get pushed around. If you get caught behind a big truck or in a gust of wind or crossing, you know, crossing a bridge on the west coast and, and a gust of wind uh, suddenly hits from the water it doesn't really affect you this bike just pushes straight through i mean this power is right there it's meant uh, to be more on the sporty side of sport touring you can kind of tell by design especially if you take off the luggage it's definitely uh, a sporting spirit behind this motorcycle and it cuts through the wind beautifully but it is very heavy in my opinion it's way too heavy to actually enjoy in any kind of sporting manner now in, in, in big, wide, sweeping curves, the bike will take that beautifully all day long. But if you actually want to enjoy this in any kind of canyon uh, carving, it's not the right tool for the job. It's just too heavy. I feel like the suspension does not keep up with the power of the bike. And the suspension, of course, is adjustable front and rear. Like I said, from the previous, the ZX, you do inherit the inverted forks. Inverted forks always make the front suspension a little more rigid because in virtue of the, the female end being on the bottom, the female end is the, the shorter being on the bottom of the suspension instead of the top of the fork, there's less twist there's less tendency to twist there's more rigidity so you get more feel and its uh, frame as well is built so that you get more rigidity and feel of the motorcycle however again it's all about the weight the weight is just so much to manage 700 pounds is a serious seriously heavy motorcycle i'm only going to compare this to my moto guzzi 1400 california obviously that's more on the side of a muscle cruiser but um, everything about that bike seems more manageable, even though it also is 700 pounds, another 1400 cc engine, uh, although that's a twin. But uh, you'll hear me compare to that motorcycle very often because I just have a tendency to grab those keys instead whenever I have to make a trip. So that's why this bike is going to be sold, hopefully, to one of you guys. So, okay, so we talked about the power plant transmission, six speed transmission in the first iteration so 2008 2009 which is widely considered generation one of this particular uh, 1400 concourse the transmission is largely not tuned for low end rpm so low end power so you have to actually wind up to 5000 plus rpms to get any kind of serious power and it actually sounds like you're winding an electrical motorcycle it's kind of interesting you can hear it But until you hit that 5,000 mark, everything after that comes pretty damn quickly. But until you hit that 5,000 RPM mark, there's, there's not, a, not a lot of power for, for being such a big motorcycle. Everything's kind of geared towards the top. And in my opinion, too much towards the top. Hence the desire to be riding 90, 100 miles an hour all day long on a highway. And it's just problematic, you know, unless you like to be riding in fifth gear when there's another gear there. That's up to you but uh, six gear is marked as overdrive so in later models starting 2010 when there was a huge revamp of the body and some other uh, additional details which i'll talk about those uh, those motorcycles gen 2 kind of addressed a little bit of that and 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 the transmission went on to be re revised and revisited by kawasaki as the years went by so 
uh, no longer so much an issue um, on the later models as on the 2009. What the 2009 also did not come with is any kind of cruise control, any kind of traction control, any kind of rider modes, or ABS standard. You could buy it, but standard, it did not come. So that's very problematic. If this is a sport touring motorcycle, you need cruise control, you need traction control, because it's assumed you're gonna be riding this in the rain. You need different ride modes because again, it's gonna be assumed that you're gonna be riding this in the rain. It's got a ton of power. Maybe you don't wanna always use that power. Maybe it's important to you to detune it a little bit for let's say city riding or for MPGs, which also is uh, an area for improvement on this bike. But, um, and very crucially, ABS. ABS should be standard for these kinds of bikes. They're very heavy bikes. It's not that difficult to lock up the rear wheel. Uh, I do it all the time for fun, but it's not fun if it catches you off guard, right? So it's assumed that this is a commuter and a motorcycle for long distance touring and with a lot of weight and passenger and luggage, etc., you're gonna be caught in rains and whatnot and you wanna have all those driver aids. Now, all of that's been fixed in the new versions of the motorcycle. All of that comes standard from 2010 on ABS came standard and from then on also the traction control by Kawasaki and the rider modes has also been incorporated into the bike from 2010 on also the brakes were linked so it's a it's a Kawasaki system of linked brakes and this system saw a lot of actually surprisingly negative feedback in the very early stages, so much so that Kawasaki revamped it, detuned it a little bit so that it did not have such a big grip uh, when you apply the front, the rear applies, and vice versa. Uh, when you apply the rear, the front applies automatically to an extent. I like it. It's a system that Goldwings use, uh, VFRs use as well, and those are really, really great system and almost kind of defeats the need for ABS unless you actually find uh, a troubles with slipping the rear wheel on, on, on some nastier weather riding. But uh, I like the system. I don't know why people would complain uh, unless you really, really dislike any, any of those kinds of aids. But being a purist myself, now that I own a Moto Guzzi that does have all, all of these systems, including three traction control levels and three rider modes, I actually find myself using that very often. There's a rain mode, the sport mode, and a turismo mode. And all those modes are very useful when you're riding a motorcycle in various weather or if you just want to detune for a little while. Uh, if you get caught in the rain, of course, you don't want 1400 cc's kicking to that rear wheel, 100 foot pounds of torque. That could really kick it out. So um, very, very necessary for big bikes like this. And uh, for these first generations, you also don't get a lot of information from the very unappealing, in my opinion, uh, digital display. So it's one rectangular digital display, unappealing in every way. It's just old school, not, not very appealing, but it, you do get uh, the speedometer and the tack that is analog. That's kind of nice, although arguably not sufficient to tell you, you know, what speed you're going at on a, on a, motor, on a motorcycle that's so powerful. I prefer to have a digital speedo and, a, and an analog uh, tack, but uh, they, they don't give you any valuable information other than the basics. You get the gas mileage, current MPGs, average MPGs, and that's it. I mean, obviously you get the uh, coolant temperature and you get uh, how much, you know, how much gas is in the reservoir. But other than that, there's no information. There's no ambient temperature, nothing to the sort, which is kind of interesting being a touring uh, adventure or sport touring motorcycle. I feel like some of those uh, items need to be standard as well. Later on, some of those were added, but in this very early model, there's a lot to be desired in that regard. It's nice that they provide you with a tire pressure gauge. This is obviously located in the tire itself and you get a red warning light if the pressure drops below 32 or so PSI. So overall looks of the bike, you know, I don't like to talk about the aesthetics, but not a super appealing motorcycle. In fact, I feel like I'm riding a cow. It's like if you ever mounted a cow before, it's just these big ears, you know, I'm just waiting for for these mirrors to suddenly start, you know, automatically uh, shunting off the flies, you know, like the cows do when they're happy in pasture and their ears are out. 
it's just what is going on here. One, they're very, very wide. It makes lane splitting a little tricky sometimes, and I'm perfectly comfortable. Uh, a note about that, you'll see me lane split a lot in this video because that's, we're in California where it's legal. I have a two-part video on lane splitting. It's contrary to popular belief. It's much safer than not having that ability to lane split four riders. And uh, there's uh, numerous benefits. You can you can click on the link below to, or above to, uh, to hear more if you're interested. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting how many misconceptions there are around lane splitting. You'll see me do it all the time. I feel super comfortable doing it, I'm not pushing any personal limits. So uh, I, I say that because often I get comments about how inappropriate I ride. That It's all legal, folks, it's, everything's in order. So take a look if you're interested. The first video is about lane splitting benefits, common misconceptions. And the second part is about how to do it properly, safely, eff effectively, and respectfully. So take a look at that if you're interested. So yeah, very, very wide actually. The, the, the luggage itself uh, is 39 inches wide. It's not the widest part of the bike. So it's even wider in the mirrors. It, it rivals that of the Goldwing, which is much physically much larger motorcycle in weight as well. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I'll talk about the luggage in a second, but it is, it is very wide. The benefit is your, your legs get covered from the wind. Um, the earlier models, 2009 including, in city driving tended to bring a lot of heat to the legs uh, through, through the fairings itself. So in 2010, there were some revisions made to the fairing to not allow so much heat to pass through to the rider. And that was of course very appreciated. But then again, it's not a bike you're gonna be riding through the town for your regular groceries, I argue. I think it's just too heavy to maneuver, you know? So um, I, I just don't think the suspension is up for the task for any kind of slow moving city riding. So this is just desert, you know, if you need to make it from, I don't know, from Munich to Berlin for an afternoon wedding, you know, on the Autobahn, 150 miles an hour is where it tops out all day long. You're not gonna feel the wind, you're not gonna get tired. You can pack your suit in there, 35 liters per size, it's absurdly large, uh, and uh, you'll be rested enough to have a good time, let's say. But for here, where you can't use all that power, in the United States I'm talking about, where you're limited, I think it's, it's a bike that can really get you in trouble if you lack maybe some self-control in that regard behind you know twisting the throttle. So another thing I don't like, so I, again, we're not gonna talk about looks, but yeah, the looks are a little dated. It's kind of interesting that s since 2008, when the bike came out, there's very little change. People who are not familiar with it can go to the, auto sh to the motorcycle show or to a Kawasaki dealership see the current model and be like, oh, it's the same bike, just a different color, very much the same. So uh, I guess that speaks to how well they sell, you know, if they don't need, feel the need to change too much about their looks. But uh, I think not, not, not ov overwhelmingly not a beautiful motorcycle by any means. It's not one of those bikes where you, you know, get off it and you look look back you know over your shoulders you just need to take a one last look before you leave for the office for the day so i don't know it's, it's for me in any case but to each their own i just think um yeah they could modernize a little bit even the previous models the 1000s were very boxy you can't believe that this was a bike sold until 2006 you know it's crazy it just looks so much older so kawasaki has a tendency to do that think of the ninja 250s the same ninja 500s anyways uh, another very beneficial factor, which maybe less so than it actually appears to be, is the electronically controlled windshield. So the windshield can raise quite a lot and the angle changes as well. Uh, however, I don't find myself riding in the low mode at all. So by a push of a button, it raises and it changes the wind hitting me in the throat. Unbelievably so, completely inadequate protection when the windshield's down to actually hitting over me and I'm actually not looking through the glass. I, I have plenty of, of uh, space above it to look and I, I appreciate that because I don't want to be looking through the screen to be very honest. I, I don't like to even ride with my vis visor down so uh, it's good to have it but I just never use it in the down position. Never. I never use it because I don't use the city in the city or I don't use this bike in the city. Yeah, so I, I just don't as soon as you hit 45 miles an hour, it starts to get loud and buffety and all that. You just have to push it up. So, yeah, I mean, it's good to have, but then again, seems kind of useless to me, to be honest. And uh, I think this is probably going to raise some eyebrows, but you should ask yourself if you ride this motorcycle or if you've ridden something with adjustable windscreen, when do you ride with it down? Even my Goldwing, which has manual adjusting windscreen, so arguably harder to adjust, 
because you have to do it physically, you know, when you're stopped. I always ride with it up. I just don't like to be hit by the wind. I don't like my passengers to be hit with the wind. So um, cool to have, not seemingly all that valuable in essence. The later models had a different windscreen as well, where in the bottom there was a little vent also that was adjustable uh, in the bottom part of the windscreen. So those, that's how you can kind of tell. There's a few ways you can tell if you're looking at an older first gen or the later gens. And that is first, the rims colors were changed from the silver to the black. And uh, the, the fairings were changed minutely. That would be harder to tell unless you really know what you're looking at. But the luggage, for example, the, the dark around the luggage disappeared and that was all color matched. Uh, so those are some of the ways that you could tell that you're looking at a at a newer model. The seat as well was all one tone color. This one is is two tone as you can see. The seat height itself, 32 inches, 100 no 815 millimeters. So approachable, reachable by most riders. I'm 5'8", 180 pounds. I don't feel this motorcycle to be overwhelming in any other way than the the, the weight of it. In fact, I was pulling out of my driveway, and I I, I had my foot slip a little bit. And I find myself catching the bike, and I mean it was one of those like my news like oh snap this is heavier than I than I expected, and I ended up like hurting my shoulder even though it was not an aggressive move or anything. It was just trying to catch all that weight. The weight is high, so you get that also from the 5.8 gallon tank, which is very large, but not gas mileage wise. It's not a very efficient motorcycle. I'm getting 34 miles a gallon. Uh, I only noticed that because I have to stop. Uh, at the gas station more often than I normally do. I'm not a fan of that. Not because gas is expensive necessarily, although that's obviously a factor. It's just annoying to have to do that every third day, you know? Um, I don't know, I'm not, so in, in the range is about 150 miles. Obviously it all depends how you ride, but I, you're gonna ride that motorcycle fast. That's what it's for. So 150 mile range for a bike like this is not great. Let's say, let's be honest, because uh, this is a sport touring motorcycle. I wanna go to Las Vegas tonight I don't want to have to stop two or three times just to like fill the bike. I think, I think it should be able to make it uh, in, in, in less stops and it should be more efficient. So to address efficiency and emissions, this engine has the, what is it? The uh, valve, variable valve timing technology. Uh, for Honda, for example, you know this as the VTEC. So what that does is that introduces, uh, well, there's various ways that can happen, but let's say there's different lobes on the camshaft that manipulate timing, uh, length, and how open the valves remain, both the intake and the exhaust valves. So it's not purely mechanical, because purely mechanical, then you cannot really adjust it. Uh, the ECU on this motorcycle constantly adjusts it so that it can make it more efficient, more fuel efficient, more power efficient, and it can meet certain emission standards which are always becoming more and more stringent. So uh, it does have that uh, technology which is actually borrowed from Mitsubishi's automotive sectors. It's kind of interesting. Every automotive uh, and motorcycle company has their version of the variable uh, valve timing. What is that called? Variable uh, valve, yeah, VVT, right? I think that's what it's called. So um, again, in Honda, it's VTEC. I think Fiat is actually credited with creating it back in, I don't know, the 60s. So now it's kind of the, the, the standard. So that is Kawasaki's version. Obviously, this is not something you notice like the VTEC. The VTEC in the Honda kicks in at, I don't know, 6.5, 6.8 RPM, and you hear two more valves open up. You hear it, you feel it. This isn't like that. This is very minute, electronically controlled, adjustments that the computer makes for this motorcycle to make it more efficient but more technology nonetheless so we spoke about the engine we spoke about the transmission we spoke about the looks we spoke about the suspension the rear is also adjustable by a quick knob and that's appreciated because you'll adjust it more often based on the weight passengers etc uh, so that's kind of nice on the left hand side you can even do it on the fly I spoke about the shaft drive and the shaft effect and the tetra lever suspension of the motorcycle that prevents that wheel from bucking up underneath. 
collecting up underneath the motorcycle when the power is twisted. Let's talk about shifting and the clutch. So the clutch, uh, the components are all very smooth, very very familiar Kawasaki quality components. No, no complaints there. It shifts like butter. I gotta say, I love that about it. Uh, the clutch itself is a slipper clutch, always has been, even in the previous Concorde, and you need that. For a motorcycle like this, when you come to a full stop quickly, let's say, or in a, in a hard corner, you shift down, you don't want that rear wheel to break. So the slipper clutch takes on some of that force and allows the power to be slipped out, let's say, taken in so that the wheel doesn't, doesn't tend to lock up in the rear, which is very, very important for safety reasons not just when you're pulling to red light, but if you're actually taking a corner a little too quickly. Uh, also, if you, you know, something crosses the road real quick when you're just about to take that corner, you shift down quickly. You don't, you don't want that rear wheel to, to kick in, especially when you're leaned over on a heavy bike like this. Okay, so we spoke about gas mileage. We spoke about weight. The seat, super comfortable. They actually made the seat a little narrower here to the front so that it can accommodate even shorter riders. Again, I'm 5'8", no, no issues with handling the bike whatsoever. And again, one way that you can tell if this is a newer or an older model is by the color of the seat. In newer models, it'll be all one color. The luggage. We buy these bikes so that we can enjoy the OEM luggage that's very useful. And I gotta say for this, the luggage is awesome. The luggage is easy to remove. It's actually no two model modes just one turn of the key opens it or removes it. I love that a lot. 35 liters, massive. They can fit a full-size helmet with a GoPro inside. So you don't have to remove the GoPro, let's say. I, I always have a GoPro on my helmet. Uh, arguably, most of you are gonna have a GoPro on your helmet. So it's kind of nice not to have to remove the camera from your helmet and you can just store it in. If you're you know, a businessman going to the office, you can fit a backpack, you can fit uh, a messenger bag, you can fit a four inch binder in this thing. I mean, just, it's just awesome, you know? And I like that. So if, however, you find them a little too bulky, too big, because you can see them in the mirrors and all that, uh, then you can opt for Corbin replacements that look the same, have the same scratch design, but uh, are down from 35 liters to 27, something to that effect. Don't quote me on that, but they're much narrower and they bring it down from 39 to 32 inches so of width, something to that effect. In any case, less wide because the bike is really bulky and massive. The lights themselves are very bright. Obviously, if, you, if you're not satisfied, that's easy to, to, to handle just by replacing the light bulb. What I do like is that they provide you with manually adjusting angles for the headlights on each side uh, of your handlebars and that's really useful because if you have a passenger a lot of weight that's going to affect your angle of the light so it's kind of nice to be able to adjust that other than a 12 volt but that's it that's there's nothing else on this dash uh, which is kind of again very interesting considering this is a flagship uh, sport touring uh, grand sport touring heavyweight in the Kawasaki lineup obviously 2009 but it's interesting that it didn't come with that speaking of the handlebars uh, again five foot eight I could still use another inch to be honest so I'm not at all kind of uh, on my lower back on my wrists uh, so I don't like how they look I think that was like an afterthought almost because you could actually see the interior design the the webbing the what do they call that like the the honeycomb support brace and I, I don't want to see that. It just looks super aggressive and awkward. And I just don't think they look very nice, to be honest. Uh, obviously, aesthetics to each their own. They, they function like they should, but it's just it just stands out. It's very in your face. So I'm not a fan of these bolt on super tall handlebars. And as far as the throttle is concerned, I do notice myself numbing in my right hand, my throttle hand. Why? Because I think the throttle is a tad too hard. So as compared to my Moto Guzzi, which the throttle is a tad too light, I find this to be hard enough where it makes me numb my hand all the time. I mean, half an hour on the bike and my hands go numb. So it's something that could have been uh, improved. So the thing with this Kawasaki Concourse, they provide you with the key pass. It's a Kawasaki proximity key, basically and you have the luggage key here. It basically goes on the back of the key itself, the fob, 
and the fob, as long as it's on your person, the motorcycle will turn on. Uh, it's, it's a little tricky though because I walked away for quite a distance and the motorcycle kept running. It makes me wonder would it actually keep running after the bike was maybe taken or something. So uh, I also don't like the fact that you, it's hard to work with gloves. Uh, this little button that takes the key out. And another thing is the little here, the little hole that they provide is impossible to fit a normal ring in there, like the normal key ring. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to add, you know, your house key or or any kind of way to tether the thing. So I had to use a phone strap little handle here for that. Kind of annoying, to be honest. I, I mean, I like the fact that you don't have to stick a key everywhere. And the fact that you can warm up the motorcycle, the motorcycle can be running and you could still access the luggage. That's pretty great. But uh, I don't know. I'm still still thinking about if this is good or, or, or not necessary. Also very expensive to replace. In the later models, you would get only one of these. Uh, in the earlier models, like this one, 2009, I have two. This little pocket is great for something like a key fob, but it barely fits my phone. I don't have a big phone, and I actually keep it in a wallet, and the wallet just doesn't even fit. So it's it's a little useless in that regard. It would be nice to have to be able to just to fit the phone in there, but um, and if I can, sometimes I can just shove it in there but I can't fit anything else. I can't fit my my glasses or anything to that effect. So if it does pop open, you could still, you know, use it. You could still ride the motorcycle. It's not gonna affect handling, but um, it's a good idea, but it could have been made a little bit bigger. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. I hope this review has been helpful. If you're considering this bike, I would opt in for the older models, 2010 and up. But again, great motorcycles, super dependable. Obviously, police use them. That tells you everything you need to know about dependability. Um, actually, I purchased this from a cop who had one for himself after using it at work. So great motorcycles, easy to make you a convert. But uh, again, I would opt in for the older or the younger models, 2010 and up. Thanks again. If you like sport touring bikes, check out my playlist. I review quite a few of them here. Uh, Happy New Year 2022 is upon us. Safe travels to you and yours. And until the next one, Nick, I'm out. Thank you for watching. I hope this review has been helpful, informative, and entertaining. Although my goal here principally is not to entertain. I consider this channel to be an educational endeavor. And I thank you for your time. And I also thank you for your participation in the comment section below. Anybody who's here knows the value of the comment section. You get owners who uh, rebut any mistakes or uh, confirm something that I've said. So that's huge for me. I, I learned so much from you, you wouldn't believe. I learned more from my viewers than my viewers learned from me and I'm so grateful for that. So if you like this video, please give a thumbs up. Bless the algorithms of YouTube so that videos like these and this channel that's completely organic and independent can remain so. Now, for you, if you're familiar with how this channel works, every motorcycle that I review is something that I own and I always offer it to my viewers first. It goes on sale uh, a week after it's been offered on this channel to viewers first. The way you could bid on this motorcycle if you're interested is first, go in the description of the channel you'll have a link to a patreon page you can contribute as little as a dollar a month that step is necessary so that we have a secure private mode of communication that's not through youtube and google so if you want to bid on it you can do it through the patreon messaging center bid on it that way what's your highest price we're not going to go back and forth whoever of my viewers decides to uh, offer the highest price that highest price deserves to take it. They deserve to own it. It'll go to them. It'd be my pleasure to share this motorcycle with the viewing public of this channel, supporters like you. That's all you have to do. Just click on the Patreon link, send me a message. What do you think this bike is worth to you? What would you like to have it for? Currently, it's just under 19,000 miles, needs nothing. It's ready to go. Uh, never been down, obviously. Just a beautiful, awesome motorcycle and you watch the video you have exactly all the information that i could share with you about it so there's that that goes for all my bikes i'm going to replacing i'm going to be replacing this kawasaki with the vfr the vfr is a very special bike to me i moved to california on a vfr it's much lighter i like the way it feels and uh, i've been looking for the white one for six years now
I found a few, they've been dropped. This is high mileage, but it's just, I love it. All the luggage and everything, just perfect condition. So stay tuned for a review of that. In the meantime, stay safe. And till the next video, Nick, I'm out.